Today we're in chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 and enter into our study. And as I've been doing, as we've been looking at this particular book, I'll give you again a brief background and remind you of a few things that we've already looked at, and then we'll move into our study. But we begin at verse 1, and we read verses 1 and 2, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shiganat. And I know I didn't pronounce that right, but you don't know how to say it, so <laughs> don't say anything to me after the service. <laughs> O oh Lord, I have heard your speech, was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. And this one phrase, in wrath, remember mercy, has been a tremendous scripture in my life for, for many years. In wrath, remember mercy. So let's begin by reminding ourselves about the book of Habakkuk. Remember that Habakkuk has been crying out to God. And he cried out to God in chapter 1. Uh, because he had seen so much evil, and yet it seemed to the prophet Habakkuk that God didn't notice. And so he began to wrestle. He was wrestling with the age-old question of why evil seems uh, to prosper, why those who perform evil acts seem to get away with it. And he was wrestling with the Lord. It reminds us of Psalm 73 in verse 3, where the psalmist says, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then in verses 12 and 13 of the same psalm, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. And so I'm sure that there are many people who love the Lord who sometimes wonder why it seems that those who don't care about Him prosper, at least outwardly, and those who do care about the Lord and want to serve Him seem sometimes to, to not be treated so well. And that's what he's doing at that moment. He's saying... Uh, God, he's saying, I see so much, I've been crying out to you, I see so much evil, and yet it seems that, that you're ignoring it, you're doing nothing about it. And so as he was wrestling with the questions there in chapter 1, we know that God began to answer him, and he made it clear that though Israel appeared to be getting away with sin, God made it clear that he was moving, and that he was about to fulfill a promise that he had made, a promise to bring judgment on them when they sinned. And he had made this promise to them many centuries before, when he had given them the law. If you're taking notes, you might want to note Deuteronomy chapter 28 in verses 49 through 52 because this is what the Lord had said would occur if they walked away from him. He says, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favor to the young. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock, and the produce of your land until you're destroyed. They shall not leave you grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they've destroyed you. They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. So God had stated to them, if you walk away from me, I'll bring judgment and I'll bring a nation against you, a language you don't understand, and they're going to destroy you. This is what he does through the nation of Babylon. Now, as Habakkuk had heard these words, we know that he began to reel in horror, and he began to question the Lord, how can a nation more evil than we do this to us? How can you allow something like this to occur? Now, he knew that God would answer, and he was open to his answer. As a matter of fact, he also says, I, I was open to his correction. I, I wanted to hear where I was going wrong. And so as he waits, God begins to answer. That's when we looked at chapter 2. In chapter 2, God is aware that Babylon's a proud and arrogant nation, and he's going to use them to chastise Israel. But they're not going to get away with it. They're going to be judged also because they're proud, they're vicious, idolatrous, and they're violent. And though they'll be used to chastise the nation, they too will be dealt with. Now, after this is revealed, Habakkuk is finally brought to a place of simply trusting God to do his best. And that's where we pick up in his story here in chapter 3. Habakkuk is moved to write a song of praise to God. Now, if you want some simple chapter headings, in chapter 1, we saw Habakkuk wrestling with God. In chapter 2, we see him waiting and watching. In chapter 3, we see him we see him wrestling, waiting, watching, and now we see him worshiping. He begins in verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigiana. Now, no one knows the exact meaning of that word I just mispronounced. 
It's commonly believed that it had something to do with music, either instructing the musician about how to play the song or possibly being a musical instrument. We know that in the King James Version, the word is used in the title of Psalm 7, and it has been translated there, a meditation, a meditation of David. But we're really not sure exactly what that word means. But it begins, we know, with the words, a prayer of Habakkuk. Now, after God had made it clear that he's going to bring the Babylonians against Israel, we see Habakkuk praying. This reminds us of the prayer that Solomon prayed in 1 Kings chapter 8. If you're taking notes, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. In that passage of Scripture, Solomon said this. He said, When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and confess your name and pray and make supplications to you in this temple, then here in heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. And that's what he's praying. It reminds us of that prayer because that's what Solomon had prayed, Solomon anticipating rebellion in the nation. And we see Habakkuk in a, a similar response because after he heard that God was bringing judgment, he now prays that God will remember mercy. That's what we see when he says, in wrath, remember mercy. In verse 2, he said, O Lord, I have heard your speech, and I was afraid. O Lord, revive your work. God, you're about to bring severe judgment on this disobedient nation, and I tremble before you. He's made it clear that the just are going to live by faith, but still the coming judgment is so incredible that he is trembling at the thought of it. You know, on the one hand, we know that God has stated to us that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. You read the book of Revelation, and, and you read about all the judgments that are going to come. And if you have a heart for people at all, it ought to cause us to tremble at the reality of God's coming judgment. And the reality of that ought to provoke us to serve the Lord with more fervency. Now, I know that when I got saved almost 32 years ago and began to attend Calvary Chapel there in Costa Mesa, I know that the Spirit, in terms of the Holy Spirit's working in that church at that time as it's continued all the, all the time that I've been aware of Calvary ministry, I know that the Spirit had been moving Pastor Chuck at that time to encourage people to realize that we're living in the last days. Now, I was 20 years old when I first began to hear a message about the Lord returning. I'm 52 years old now. And I could say, wait, I've waited 32 years and He hasn't come. And I could get to be like some people who say, well, the Lord is delaying His coming. But the bottom line is, He's, he's 32 years closer to returning than He was when I first got saved. And it ought to be provoking me to live with even more anticipation and more excitement and with more fervency to reach out to more people. And that's why, by the way, I ought to say this. It's not in my notes, but I'll say it, and I can edit it from the, church, uh, from the tape later on. But um, I ought to say this, especially for those who may be new to our fellowship. And you might have noticed that in the last few months I've been vacant, vacating the pulpit on Sundays more often than normal. And sometimes people say, well, how come the pastor's not there? Well, part of the reason that I'm not there is because I took a vacation. But beyond that, it's because there are times that the Lord opens opportunities for me to go out and take the word someplace else, and I really feel the necessity to do that. Now, some might say, well, you know, I want to be in a church where the pastor is always there. This isn't that church. This isn't that church. And, and it's not that I don't want to be here. It's that my vision is larger than one church. I want to go out into the world and reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what I do. And I think most of you understand that, but perhaps you need to hear that or be reminded of that. This isn't the only church I pastor. I pastor a lot of churches in various places through the radio ministry. So I have opportunities to go out and minister to people who listen to us on the radio in different states, and I do that you know, fairly often. I love being here on Sunday, and I prefer being here, but sometimes the Lord opens the door and says it's time to move on. This next Friday, I'll be leaving on Friday. I come back Saturday, so I will be here, God willing, on Sunday. But I'm going to New Mexico. I'll be doing a men's conference for them in New Mexico. The Lord opens doors in different ways, and I want to be opening in those open doors. Why? Because it's the last days, and more and more people need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if the Lord has opened the door for me to do that, I'm going to do that for His glory. And I know you set me free to do that, but I ought to, I ought to address that once in a while, because especially recently I've been gone more often than, than, uh, than normal, and you may be wondering where I am. And where I am is out there doing the work of the ministry. That's what I've been doing, and the Lord has been blessing through that. But I'll tell you, we need to really realize that if we are in the last days, there are many people that still have yet to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And we ought to have a heart to reach them with the things of the Lord, and that's what we should be doing. And that's what he's speaking about here. Now, I want you to notice, he says, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. Revive your work in the midst of the years. 
In other words, even though you are bringing judgment on Israel for its sins, please bring revival to the nation. It's right that your chastening hand is upon this nation, he's saying, because we deserve it after you have chastened us, though. We pray that you revive us. And one of the things that I have as a, as a prayer for our nation, and I'm just one person out of many thousands and thousands who have a similar prayer, is uh, especially in light of recent history, the 911 attack and all, and, and I've seen so many people um, saying things like, uh, you know, God bless America and all. My prayer has been, Lord, yes, bless us, but may we first repent. May, may this nation first understand that we have walked away from you. And, and may your minister speak clearly your word and not candy coat it or sugar coat it to make it palatable to people and take out the things that they might be disturbed by. May we preach the whole counsel so that people understand that there is wrath, but there is also mercy. But we can't take away the wrath and just receive the mercy. So, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy and bring revival to this nation. Awaken us because we're asleep. When, when something is revived, it's simply made alive again. There was a time when it was alive and it needs to be revived. It needs to be brought to life once again. And nobody would really seriously argue against the fact that this nation that we live in today is a nation that was fundamentally built on Christian principles. Nobody would argue that Harvard, the first uh, college in the United States, would argue against the fact that Harvard was actually a seminary intending to train people to take the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the nation. It is so far from its original moorings and all of that, but that's how it was. The first several colleges that were even established in the United States were intended to train ministers to take out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we know that this nation has underpinnings that are distinctly Christian. All you need to do is leave the United States and go to another country and see their underpinnings, and then all you need to do is compare with what we believe and what we know and how we act with what you see in other nations. And you'll see that that's distinctly true. And so my prayer for this nation is God will revive it. At one, though, I do believe that we need a bit of a chastening. I, I think most of you would agree we have strayed from him. And, and yet at the same time, I would say, but God, remember in your wrath, remember mercy. You have chastened us, but Lord, we pray that you'll revive us. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, the apostle Peter put it this way. He said, the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. And if it begins with us first... What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So in the midst of the years, in the time of your chastening, he says, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. That word wrath there, for those who take notes, speaks of agitation or raging. It speaks of trouble, turmoil, or trembling. So he's saying, in your time of dealing with sin, be merciful to those you are angry with. Psalm 6, verses 1 and 2 says it this way, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. Psalm 130, verse 3 says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Who could stand? If the Lord wanted to take us out because we all deserve it, who could stand up against him? That's the point he's making. So he's saying, in your wrath, remember mercy. I mean, you can imagine... If God wanted to allow all his wrath to be poured out on us, what that would do. So God, we ask for your mercy on us. We deserve your wrath, but Lord, please give us mercy. The point he's making is God's love for them is so strong that even when they have sinned terribly, God is still drawn to them. It's like a husband or a father. He's so terribly in love with them that he doesn't want to desert them. One of my favorite portions of scripture is found in the Old Testament book of Hosea. And in Hosea chapter 11, I want you to hear what the, the prophet said. The Lord is speaking, and this is what God says in Hosea 11, verses 3 and 4. The Lord says, I taught Ephraim to walk. Ephraim speaks of Israel. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and I fed them. This is a picture of a loving, caring father. This is a picture of a daddy. And, and some of us as parents know what he's speaking about when he says, I took him by the arms and I, took, and I taught him how to walk. He's saying when it was a new nation, I delivered them. I was the one who brought them forth. I was the one who taught them how to take the first steps of faith. And when you, who are a parent, when your child used to crawl around, first they just lay on their stomach or lay on their back. You have to flip them over like pancakes because they can't move themselves. 
and, and you'll lay them down on the bed, you know, and they'll just lay there, you know, forever until you come and roll them over. You know, but after a while, they, they start getting some strength. It's not that long. And they begin to roll themselves over. Then you'll walk in and you say, oh, you little stinker, I had you on your back and now you're on your stomach. And then you'll walk in later on after that and you'll say, how'd you get to the edge of the bed? Because they start moving themselves like that. And now you know you better put some pillows there so they can't get, over, uh, get out and fall off the bed and all of that. Then eventually what happens is you put them on the ground and they begin to drag themselves around. At first they just kind of flail and then they start pushing. They discover that they can move and then they start coordinating their hands and their knees and their little feet and they begin to drive themselves around and then they're crawling. Eventually they're up like that and, you know, on their all fours and then they find themselves up to the, to the couch and they'll reach the couch or some table and they lift themselves up and they stand there like they're so proud. Like, look at what I'm doing, you know, and they're like that. And then they fall down. That's why you have these giant diapers on them. They fall down like that. And you tell them, oh, you're the most wonderful, great thing. Oh, you're going to be for sure, you know, a gymnast and this and that. You're going to be just great. And you love them up. And after a while, as they're standing there holding on to something, they, you'll get your keys out. This is what we used to do. We'd take our keys out like that, and we'd go, and we'd shake it. I shouldn't have done a car key, because that's all I heard from the time they were 14. Can I have a car? I wonder if it's just... <laughs> I wonder if it's associated with these. Anyway, but I would, you, you shake the keys, and they see the shiny metal, and you know this, and they reach out for it, and you'll pull it a little bit away so that they have to take a step, and before you know it, they're starting to walk. But you'll take them by the arms, and you'll hold them as they take their first steps, and when they fall, you lift them back up. That's the picture the Lord is giving here. He said, I taught them how to walk. He said, I stooped down, and I fed them. That's the picture of a loving father. He goes on, though, in Hosea, and he says in chapter 11, verses 7 through 9, My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. And he cries out with a broken heart, like, like when Adam fell in the garden. And the scripture says that Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves, and they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says that they heard the voice of the Lord God in the garden as he was crying out to them, and he was saying, Adam, where are you? And I pointed to you many times that in that particular portion of Scripture, when God is calling to Adam, it wasn't an angry arresting officer uh, finding a violator. It was a father who had lost his son and was heartbroken over the loss. And so there's a, actually a tear in the voice of God when he cried out to Adam and he said, Adam, where are you? It's the same kind of voice that you hear when he says, none at all exalt him. And then you see him saying in Hosea, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim are two of the cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come with terror. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, I love you. You're, not, you're my child. I can't desert you, and I won't destroy you. And so in wrath, he says, in wrath, remember mercy. Because, Lord, if you should mark iniquity, who could stand? If we received what we deserved, not a single person could stand against you because all of us deserve judgment. So, Lord, we ask that you would show us your mercy. Withhold your anger from us. And now he begins to sing to the Lord a song. In verse 3 through 7, God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Then he uses the word Selah. Selah usually means think about that or meditate on this. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. And so he now is singing of when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. When you read the word Timon, Timon is ancient Edom, which is Jordan or Saudi Arabia, and Mount Paran is in the Sinai Peninsula. And so this is a picture of God who has delivered before. 
And it's a prayer that he would once again deliver Israel from bondage. Now notice how he says, His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. This is a picture of the glory of God revealed in words and left to the imagination. It's like the sun rising with sunlight bursting through the darkness. He's saying God is glorious like that. He's so glorious that the eye cannot really see him because his power has been hidden. He goes on in verses 5 through 7 and says, uh, Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. He stood and he measured the earth. It may be that he's referring to the plagues and pestilences that he brought in judgment against Egypt. Because when he delivered Israel, God brought on Egypt ten plagues. If you're taking notes, you find that in chapters 7 through 11 in the book of Exodus. And we see that the plagues that he brought on them, if you study the, that chapter and those chapters in Exodus, you see that the plagues that God had brought on Egypt were actually uh, judgments against the false gods that were worshipped by the Egyptians. So you know that he brought the plague of blood and frogs and lice and flies. He brought disease on beasts and boils and hail and locusts and darkness and ultimately he killed all the firstborn. And every one of these plagues were intended to bring judgment on the gods that were worshipped by the Egyptians. Notice he says that he stood and he looked. Now invading armies usually will push into a nation, but the point he's making is God doesn't. He simply stands and he calmly stares at those that he's about to overwhelm. Because as the one who owns the earth, he simply surveys all that belongs to him. He speaks of Ethiopia and modern Jordan trembling at his power and his glory because news has traveled there that God is busy bringing judgment. In verses 8 and 9, he continues and says, O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Selah. So he poetically describes God opening the water before the children of Israel. Now we know as we study again the Old Testament on one occasion, he, he parted the Red Sea. And later on, he opened the Jordan so that they could cross over. And we remember that the Egyptian chariots got stuck in the mud, but God's chariots of salvation delivered them. In verses 10 and 11, continuing, he says, The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. When Moses received the law, the mountain trembled and the Jews were frightened. You remember the story of how that Moses went up there on the mountain to receive the law from God. And the Jews who remained behind and seen, had seen him go up into the mountainside there saw the lightning and they heard the thunder and they had told them, you go up there. We don't want to go up there. They trembled at the sight of the glory of God. And so that's the picture that we have here. And it reminds us of this. In verse 11, it reminds us, the sun and moon stood still. It reminds us of Joshua's longest day. And how that when the children of Israel were entering into the promised land, that the sun and the moon stood still. If you're taking notes, Joshua <coughs> gives us this in chapter 10. You might want to turn there with me. Joshua chapter 10, and let me read it to you from that passage. Joshua's longest day. Very interesting story. Joshua, chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. In that portion of Scripture, the Bible says... Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Now is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. That's called Joshua's longest day. And it would seem that this is what's being referred to back in Habakkuk chapter 3. When he says in verse 11, The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went at the shining of your glittering spear. Now moving on in Habakkuk in chapter 3. Continuing in verse 12, he says, You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. 
You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundations to neck. And again, he says, think about that. Salah. So when he says you marched through the land in indignation, as the children of Israel entered into the land, they took it by right of conquest. You remember that when they took Jericho, their part in its conquest was to march around the city, sound a trumpet, and the walls fell before them. You know, when we grew up, we might have heard the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. But in reality, he didn't fight the battle of Jericho. God did. Their responsibility was to blow some, some trumpets. The walls fell down, then they took the city. And so the Lord is always presented, and you might find this is an important point in your life, by the way. The Lord is always presented as the one who gives us victory. He has his part, which is to do the fighting. We have our part, which is to do the obeying and to do what he says. And when I pursue him, and this has been so important in my life because I've seen, the, I've seen it when I do pursue him versus when I haven't. When I pursue the Lord, when I'm open and obedient to him, I've seen God give me victory after victory after victory. It's when I have this resistance to his will. It's when I say, well, I'm not quite sure whether I want to do that or I can do that or I'm going to do that that I find that the, the Lord's hand is removed from me, not in the sense of, uh, of my salvation departing, but in the sense of, of the fellowship that we've been having through obedience to Him, that begins to be diminished because something makes a separation between the Lord and myself. And my fellowship is interrupted. And I really believe in this. I'm learning more and more, and perhaps it's about time. It's only been, what, 32 years. It's, it's time to learn some of these things, you know. I'm starting to discover some things. I'm starting to discover that Father knows best. You know, I was talking to my son Dave yesterday, and we were talking about, um, you know, just a father and son kind of talk. It was a good, good little visit with my son. And now that my son's going on 24 years old, uh, he was sharing with me, and we were talking and all. And I said, you know, son, <clears throat> the only thing that I really ever want for you is for you to trust your father's advice. I've been there. I've done that. And if you'd listen to your dad, if you listen to your dad, I can probably keep you from some pain. Because I've suffered myself, and I don't want my kids to go through the same things that I've gone through. How many of you understand what I'm trying to say? I mean, I've learned some things I don't want them to go through. And if I can, if I can keep them from going through it, I'll do the best that I can. Because some of the things that I've learned, I learned the hard way. And you know what? If I'd have listened to my dad, I wouldn't have learned some of these things by experience. I'd have just trusted my father's advice. But of course, my father didn't know anything when I was 17 years old. It's amazing how much he learned when I turned 21. In four years, he really grew up. <laughs> That's a paraphrase of Mark Twain who said, when, my father, when I was 17, I knew my father didn't know anything, but when I was 21, I was amazed at how much the old man learned in four years. <laughs> you know, and, and it's true, though, guys. If you're a young person in this room and you have a godly father, a godly mother, godly friends, you ought to listen to their advice because very often they're right, and they will save you from some things if you only listen. Think about it. Think about that guy that you wanted to be with that your godly girlfriends were saying is not good for you. And think about the result of that relationship when you ignored them and you said, oh, I can change this bad guy into a good guy. How many of you have ever discovered you can't do that? Have you discovered that that bad guy is going to turn you into a bad girl? That's what happens. Because you think you can change him. I'm amazed at that. We think we can change sin nature by being sweet. We can't. What they do is they kind of smile at us and they put their finger in and make a little dimple and say, oh, you're so cute and I love going to church with you. And all along, they're scheming on you. They're going to figure out how they're going to get you into bed. And that's the bottom line truth. And you want to know something? We don't listen. And you bring that thing home to your mom. <laughs> and your mom looks at it. <laughs> and she says, no, this is not good for you. Oh, you don't know, mom. You don't have any idea what you're talking about. Your mom hasn't told you her testimony. She knows what she's talking about. She knows what she's talking about, but she doesn't want to tell you all about it. So listen to her, because she can keep you from some pain. Because we enter into our own hurt so very often because we don't listen to what God is saying. And God is saying, listen, I'll give you victory. I, I've shown you in the Bible. What do you think I gave you those stories for? For neat, you know, stories to put you to sleep in church when the pastor's speaking? No. I gave you those stories to transform your life. These things were written for your exhortation and instruction so that you depart from evil. That's why I put these things in the Bible, you see. And, and you and I, we can do this. I've done this many times. I know what I'm speaking about. I've heard so many studies that I've ignored to my own hurt. To my own hurt. And God's word is so true. He says, I will give you victory, but you have to lean on me. 
I'll bring you through, but you have to lean on me. What do you think it was like when they were walking up to the Red Sea and they look at this, this sea in front of them and they're saying, how are we going to get through here? And they turn around and they see the Egyptian and the chariots and they're saying, oh my God. And they start telling Moses, you brought us out of Egypt to destroy us in the wilderness. What's wrong with you, man? And he says, oh God, what am I going to do? And the Lord says, stop praying and start waiting and watch what I'm going to do. You're going to see the salvation of the Lord. All you got to do is step on in and it's going to part before you. And they did. And then there goes the water and made a great movie, didn't it? <laughs> and the water goes up. And here comes the Egyptian charioteers. Imagine that. And they, they said, well, if those guys went through, we can too. And off they go and their little horses and everything. And then the Lord just lets them get stuck in the mud there. And he says, bye, and closes the water up on them. And their bodies are, are up there. The Bible says that their bodies washed up to the, shore, to the shoreline there. And that's where these uh, terrible charioteers ended up because they resisted the hand of God. The children of Israel saw deliverance. These are not children's stories. These are real. And though you and I may not walk up to the Red Sea someday and say, part before me, there are things that you do enter into. Jesus said, you'll say to this mountain, be cast into the sea and it'll obey you. What is he talking about? Is he talking about us going out there and saying, look, I'll be hired by the state. I can make some great roads for you. Just give me, you know. No, he's not saying that at all. What's he saying? He's saying you'll have mountains and obstacles that are in front of you through the rest of your life. But if you trust in me, I will make those mountains into a flat, straight road. But you have to trust in me. You exercise your faith and watch what I can do. And see, that's just the bottom line. That's what it means to be a Christian. And that's where a lot of Christians fail to understand. God is saying, look, I'm the same God that I was when I delivered the children of Israel. I'm the same God that, that, that I was when I, when I put my son Jesus Christ on the earth so that he could die for your sins. I'm the same God. I haven't moved. I can still work if you'd only trust me. And that's what he's saying here. That's what he's speaking about, how the Lord can do that. You march through the land with indignation, he says. And in verse 13, he goes on to say, you're anointed. He speaks of his anointed. Now, this could refer to the judges who judged the nations during the period of time that the judges were judging. But it may have prophetic implications, speaking of Messiah being the one who delivers and saves. And the point would be, even as you delivered the nations before, you will once again deliver Israel. From the Babylonians who will exile them, and ultimately you will deliver them by your Messiah. In verse 14 and 15, continuing, you thrust through with his own arrows the head of the villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. And so once again, he says, though your enemies came with great rage, you have turned their weapons against them. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 26, 27, whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. And they saw this throughout their history. There was a, a time during the, the period where Esther was the queen in Persia when uh, a man by the name of Haman, you remember the story of Esther, a man by the name of Haman hated the Jews. He hated the Jews. There was a Jewish man by the name of Mordecai, and uh, Mordecai would not show respect to Haman. And Haman was a, was a uh, you know, high official in the Persian court. But everybody, when Haman would walk in, everybody would bow before him except for this little Jewish guy named Mordecai. Mordecai would just look at him like, you're nothing. And he didn't like that. He didn't like that attitude at all. So he devised a way that he was going to be able to put him to death. What he wanted to do is he wanted to, uh, he had a law that was passed, and in, in the Persian court, when the, when the king passed a decree, uh, he couldn't rescind it. And what had happened is he had uh, gotten a decree passed that would uh, ultimately have all the Jews uh, be put to death. And Haman had even constructed a gallows that he was going to use to hang Mordecai on. Well, one of his great problems was is he didn't realize that Esther was a Jewess. And so when Esther went to her husband and said, uh, you know, you know the story, she's told by Mordecai, you've got to go and speak to your husband. She says, I can't, I haven't been summoned. He says, well, you're going to have to go in anyway. She says, you know that if I go in without being summoned and he doesn't, he doesn't reach his scepter out to me, you know that I can be put to death. And so Mordecai says, well, the, the price is that large. You're going to have to take the chance. And by the way, if God doesn't use you, he's going to raise somebody else up to deliver Israel. So Esther goes before the Lord and waits on God, and she ultimately goes in, and the scepters reach out to her, and her husband begins to talk about her, talk to her, what do you want, and all of that, and she says, well, there's been a decree that's been, uh, that you've uh, signed, 
that uh, is basically to put all the Jews to death in your kingdom. That includes me. And so Ahasuerus, her husband, gets pretty upset. He issues a counter decree. And that decree is if they come to your house to kill you, you can fight back. So the Jews were given permission to fight back, and that's how they survived. But he finds out, you know, what happens is Haman finds out that Esther's there with the king, and he is scared out of his mind. And so when the king leaves the room for a minute, he comes rushing up to Esther to try and beg her to please, you know, don't let me lose my life. And he trips over something and he lands on top of her. And the king comes walking in and sees Haman there with his wife. And he says, what? You'll be with my wife in my own, my own house? And Haman is hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for Mord Mordecai. The Lord has a way of turning the enemy's weapons against him. When Daniel... You remember when Daniel was, was uh, told, you're not supposed to pray, but he prayed anyway. And the ultimate price was going to be for him to be thrown to the lions. You remember, ultimately, he prayed all night, and the lions didn't, you know, didn't hurt him at all. And the people who had gotten him thrown to the lions ended up being thrown to the lions themselves. God has a way, because the scripture tells us, whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. And so when you try and harm one of God's people, well, Jesus said it this way. He said it'd be better for you a 500-pound millstone were uh, tied around your neck and you were cast into the deepest part of the sea than for you to harm one of these little ones who have trusted in me. And so God has a way of taking care of his children. And that's the point that he's making here. He's saying you're turning their weapons against you, uh, against themselves rather. In verse 15, he said, you walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. In other words, you delivered the Jews through the Red Sea and there's nothing that can stop you. Verse 16, when I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. What a way to end a psalm. In verse 16, when he says, When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. The thought of what is going to happen is so incredible, I became weak. I couldn't even stand up as I considered what Israel is about to go through. And still, I can rest in peace. Because I know the one who's control of all, in control of all things. And he closes really with a word of hope. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit beyond the vines. Now at the beginning of the book, he questioned God. Why are you not moving? But after hearing what God is about to do... He's left realizing that God is moving greatly. Times are about to get hard, but God will take care of him through all the difficulties. And his decision, through it all, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And if it takes this to make me walk in the heights with him, then so be it. He will make me to walk. If going through tough times strengthens me, if going through hard times makes me a better believer, then I'll go through the hard times. I think there are a lot of people who haven't learned that lesson yet. They haven't learned what David taught us when he says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Listen, Christian, you know this. Some of you are older saints and you understand what I'm saying right now. Some of you are newer saints, you're going to get scared. But the bottom line is, walking with the Lord is not easy. It calls for death every day. There are things in your life that you really want. I mean, you will pray and cry to God sometimes for years. I want this and God says no and you don't understand it. And you begin to wonder, why isn't God giving me what I need and I desire? And I've been asking him. And he said, if you want it, ask of it and I'll give it to you. And I've been asking, I want her. I want her to marry me. You know, I was that way. I used to pray for every girl that I ever was, well, basically saw, let alone date. <laughs> you know, I had this one girl that I was, I thought, terribly in love with. Since I married Marie, she has told me I really wasn't in love with her. I was greatly deceived. But I thought I was in love. <laughs> I saw her a couple years ago. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? It's true. 
the hourglass shaped, the sand shifted. <laughs> there are so many lessons we learn through just trusting the Lord. So many things. So many things. And I've discovered some things. I've discovered that the greatest lessons that I've ever learned are the lessons of God being with me no matter what my feelings said. God giving me victory even though I was sure that I was going to fail. God being there when I thought I was alone. And those are the lessons that strengthen your faith. And God shows you, no matter how deep you go, I am deeper still. No matter what you go through, I am there with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Though sometimes you may think that I have, no, I'm strengthening you. I'm giving you an ability to walk the heights with me. If you want to walk on the high places, you have to develop the ability to do that. So I will give you feet. I will give you, you know, he calls it hinds feet. I'll give you the ability to, to, to mount that and to, to see me in a, in a different level. But you're going to need to walk faithfully with me. You know, it amazes me. There's some people who've been Christians for 10, 15, 20 years who are still experientially one or two years old in the Lord because they refuse to pursue the things of God and learn those lessons. Can you imagine what it would be like if we actually just did what God said on a daily basis? Could you imagine how we would grow up in the things of the Lord? God has a way of working with us, and especially through the trials and the tough times. I discovered that on some very extreme personal levels, and I have been able to say this, and I can say this to you today, as I've said it two years ago when my dad died, and I can say it through all the troubles, and we do go through things ourselves that we don't stand up and talk to you about. But I'll tell you this, everything that I have ever gone through has led to me loving the Lord more because he shows his strength more. He shows his love more. There are times that you sit back and you say, Lord, I just don't understand this. I'm going to have to put this in that category of later on. We'll see what he's going to show me later on. I, was, uh, I, I became aware of something. I thought it was an interesting thing. How uh, This person said this. He said, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he said, many people are captivated and are held captive basically by two words. What if. What if? Has anybody here ever said, what if I wouldn't have done that? What if I would have done that? What if? What if I never would have gone there? What if I'd never drank that? What if I'd never, what if I'd never, what if? A lot of people are caught up with that. What if? What if captures people to the point that they stay in the past? And so what I want to do is I don't want to think of what if. I want to know what is. What is? What is the Lord doing now? What is the Lord going to do in my life in the future? And, and what, is he, what is he wanting to do in me right now? Because I, I think you need to give respect to the past, but you need to look to the future. And God wants to do a work in the future, and he wants to do a work in the present. And what he's simply saying is this. Though everything around me looks like it's going down the tubes, so everything around me looks like, and look at the way he says it. I want to read it again because it's so poetic and it's so beautiful. In verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yields no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold, and there's no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. No matter what it looks like, I know God's in control. No matter what it looks like, it looks like we're going broke. It looks like we've got no food. It looks like I've got nothing. I will have strength in the Lord because he's going to bring me through these things. And he will show himself strong on my behalf because he promised to do so. And that's what Paul taught us. If God is for you, who can be against you? We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ because he loved us. And we know this. And though sometimes it may seem like, Lord, what's going on here? Like Habakkuk started in the first chapter there. Lord, I'm wrestling with you because I don't understand it. I've been crying out to you, and I've been saying, God, what's going on? And now wait, and I'll, and I'll watch, and now I'll worship. Because you're showing me that even though I might not see your invisible hand in action, it indeed is. And I'll trust you through every step of this journey. Because you brought my people through the Red Sea. You brought them across the Jordan. You gave them this land even though they're going to be taken in exile to Babylon, you have promised to bring them back. And though everything around me looks like it's not going to happen that way, I will trust in you. And through all of this, you will strengthen me and make me into the person that you want me to be. And that's how the Lord works. That's how he works.